Well, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of our Overtime Podcast. Uh, my name is Ben Dieterle, if we haven't met. This is Gary Artazoni. Artazoni. Yeah. I always <laughs> mess up your, your last name. That's all right. And it's actually a combination of two names. It's pretty cool. Maybe you should ask him about it. But we are glad that you are here with us. Today we're doing things a little bit differently. We're normally here on Tuesdays. But today with the holidays and with everything kind of happening, it's now Thursday on January 2nd, 2020. 2020 like that's the year 2020 2020. man that year blew by but happy new year everyone we hope that you had great holidays and that you are able to celebrate that for some of you you may still be home some of you may be at work uh thank you for those that are listening to us live or watching us live and for those that are joining us on podcast on whatever way that you listen to your podcast at clcfamily.church wherever you get your podcasts whether through Apple or, uh, you know, Android, whatever you get that through, you can find us there on Spotify, Apple, all of those things. Uh, Happy New Year, man. I hope everybody had a great holiday. And we're excited to jump into, this is episode 11. This is Gary's first time doing podcasts yeah, that's right. with us. So how are you, you feeling? You feeling well, I good? Feel, I feel good, yeah. Now, yeah. I do, I do. we were kind of bantering a little bit before this, but did you make any New Year's resolutions this year? Like, did you set out to do anything? Yeah, so after preaching on Sunday, Sunday and yeah. sort of challenging the whole congregation to do stuff. I thought, yeah, I need to think of some stuff too. So, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is just, you know, what is going on with me in terms of my own um, physical development? What's going on with me? And we'll talk more about that. Yeah, you know, in terms for sure. Of the Luke talks about Jesus growing in stature and in favor with God and favor with people, gr- yeah. uh, growing in wisdom. So, I've been thinking about those categories a lot in my life. And, okay, you know, how Great. do I enter into that? So. Well, I do want to park on that. That's probably where we'll spend the majority of our time talking right. today. I do want to remind you that if you are listening or if you're here over the weekend services, if you have any questions for us, just go ahead and email us at overtime yeah. at clcfamily.church. We'd love any questions that you have. You can help kind of shape the direction that we go with these podcasts by those questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be a part of the message. If it is part of the message, obviously we welcome that. Um, But just any questions that you might have, it's kind of a weekly format for us to be able to hear what's going on within the life of the congregation. And we're excited for that. So two things before we kind of jump into a review and then we kind of get into some questions that I have. I've kind of written up a few questions for this as I listen through the message. Uh, But two quick things that we want to bring to your attention is that as we jump into a new year, as two 2020 is starting. Uh, We've got a couple different things that are happening. The first is this coming weekend, uh, both Saturday at five o'clock and then Sunday at nine o'clock and at 1045. We've got a brand new series that we're starting. Pretty excited. It's called This Is My Year, kind of taking a little bit of a jab at those motivational posters, um, but just talking about it and really specifically looking at the book of Judges. So Josh is going to be starting that series with us. It's going to be a great series, kind of looking at this cycle that the Israelites found themselves in and how we can really live into the fullness that God wants to give us if we can maybe identify some of this this sin cycle that they were in and how we can kind of get out of that. So pretty excited for that series. It should be really good. Also, so that's this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And then this, uh, it's a week yesterday. So it's, uh, let me just say date. So on January 4th and 5th, we start this brand new series. Right now it's January 2nd. So 4th and 5th, we start this brand new series. And then on January 8th, which is this coming Wednesday, it's not quite a week. We are pretty excited that Cal is going to be kicking back off. Um, we're going to have some new classes that that's are going right. to be starting. That's right. We were talking about one on financial peace that's yep. looking to yep. kind of get started. There's testimonies. testimonies Pastor is Jeff is continuing yep. a, a new teaching. Testament. Yeah. So if, a lot of good stuff. if you haven't checked out CAL, which is just a, an acronym or it stands for Connect on Wednesday, um, we'd love to have you be a part of that. We yep. want to encourage you to be a part of community. And this is one of the ways that we do that. So come on out. It starts at 5.30. There's a meal at 5.30, and then at about 6.15, classes start, and we're wrapped up by about 7.30 or so. So that's I'd right. love to have you be a part of that. So that's kind of the quick announcements. Maybe it was quick. Maybe it wasn't, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, we're excited. So good. like I said, we are excited, pretty pumped to have Gary here. He he preached over this past weekend. So um, Gary, did you want to give us kind of a recap of what we talked about kind of as we finished sure, up the Wonder sure. Series? Yeah. So, you know, in this whole Wonder Series, we've been looking at how it is that um, how Luke, as an investigative journalist, actually 
looked into the life of Christ and then be, brought things to us in a way where we could affirm that Jesus was this Messiah that was coming into the world. And so it's been fun to see that. And But we've been trying to also recapture this sense of wonder. And so um, entering into the story again to try to figure out, so how is God showing up and what does that mean for us? And so this sermon specifically looked at um, Jesus as a 12-year-old. I mean, it was yeah. it started with Jesus being presented in the temple um, and um, then Zachary Zechariah, or excuse me, um, Simeon and Anna both come up, they're prophets, and they start to say, hey, this is the Christ, and there's all this excitement that takes place. But then um, Luke actually goes into this sort of funny story where Luke, now Jesus is 12 years old. So he goes from being eight days old to 12 years old, right. like just in a moment. And um, But it's also the only story about Jesus as a pre-adolescent that exists in the New Testament. So it's really fun to sort of see that. And, yeah. and Jesus goes off with his parents to the Passover feast. And at that feast, then he stays behind and his parents come home and then realize he's not with them. So they go back looking for him and all this stuff happens. And then Luke basically ends that passage by talking about what well, we just said that Jesus grew in stature, he grew in wisdom, he grew in favor with God and with people. And so mm. that's where it ends up. Yeah. So I feel like there's a lot that we can kind of talk through and, sure. and uh, yeah. uh, don't necessarily have any questions specifically about this. Um, but I did have questions as I just kind of thought through it and as we sure. talked through it and even some of the things that you had mentioned, just curiosity on my own part. Um, as we kind of went through it, and like you said, we were focusing, you focused on Jesus at eight days old as he's right. consecrated at the temple where he's set right. apart, um, and then also at 12. So uh, as we get into this, kind of that first chunk, and we were looking at, it was uh, Luke chapter 2, starting at, I think, in 21. Let me yeah, look at my notes. Yeah, correct. it was 21 um, through 52. So Luke right. 2, 21 through uh, 2, 52. Um, and I do want to park on 52 as we get to the end. But one of the things that it said uh, as we were reading, verse 23 said that um, that the firstborn male of every family was to be consecrated. Correct. Or I think in the translation you had read, it's designated holy to the Lord. What did that actually mean? Does that mean that like the firstborn of every family was then shipped off to like, I don't know, this church boarding school where they like, you know, <laughs> this is what they have to do. Like, right, what does right, that right, actually right, right. mean yeah, when it yeah. says that they were consecrated or they were designated holy to the Lord? Like, I, that was just a question that I thought of yeah, as we went through question. that. So, so it's interesting. There's some purification rites that Mary and Joseph have to go through. Yeah, right. And the different, different um, commentators have different views of this. But, but part of it is that, um, that Mary herself actually had to present an offering, which was for her own sort of cleansing after having childbirth. Right. And there's a feeling among scholars that that was true for Joseph too, because Joseph was there at the birth. So in the Jewish, um, in the Jewish system, um, blood is really significant. Blood right. actually refers to life. So the fact that Mary and Joseph are present when the baby is born, there's this sense of the blood that's a part of that. And so there's this purification where they bring these two turtle doves hmm. um, or a pigeon, and they bring that as a part of the cleansing ritual right. okay. to the temple. Now, the other thing that's interesting about that is that um, usually people would bring like a, a lamb or a ram or something but Mary and Joseph, by bringing this pigeon and a couple of turtle doves, are actually announcing sort of their poverty. Right. Like right, they're not as rich as everybody else. So they bring this and they meet the requirements of the law. Um, but what happens there is that as they're in that temple setting, then all of a sudden um, Luke mentions Simeon and Anna. Yeah. And all of a sudden everything starts to break loose. And, right, right. And they're like, hey, this is the Christ. And, you know, and, and so people are like, whoa, what's going yeah. on? So Yeah. And so as you said, as you're reading through this story in Luke 2, you see Simeon and Anna, who, at least for me, as I, I read through that chapter, uh, it looks like, man, there's uh, my speculation or my thought, I guess, is that there's more to this story. Like Simeon, yeah. here's this guy that's just yeah. it seems like he's chilling, waiting for Jesus. Like that's all that he's doing. And Anna, right. who the Bible says is 84 or had yeah. been a widow, like she's old that's right. and she's just hanging out. Like it sounds like she didn't leave the temple ever either, just waiting for Jesus. So like, that's correct. is there anything more maybe known or I don't know. Is there maybe a prominence that S Simeon and Anna, uh, Anna, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, that they have. Like, I guess if Luke is writing this as an investigative journalist, why include them? And yeah, yeah. and then I guess 
part of that question is, is do we know anything more about them? Yeah, so I didn't do research on that as much in terms of knowing anything else about them. But they they really serve. But nothing specifically mentioned within Scripture about them beyond no, this, this, right? No, this is it. Yeah. This is like the one-time occurrence that, they, that right. they're there. And um, But what's interesting about that is that Luke is very clear of making it sure that the reader knows that the Holy Spirit has placed them there specifically yeah. in order to, to say and make this proclamation about who Jesus is. So, right, right. so this is the one place where Luke three different times actually mentions um, Simeon being brought to the temple by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the same thing's true of Anna. She's actually a prophet. Yeah. And so, you know, so there's this interesting thing where I think what, what Luke wants the reader to know is that this is it, this is the Christ, right. you know, so, so, Stand up and pay attention. Listen to what it is that Simeon's saying, what Anna's saying, and realize this is the Messiah that came. Now, the weird thing about that is Jesus comes as a different kind of Messiah right, than right. what Israel was looking for. Right. So that's also complicated because what, what um, Israel was looking for was a, a leader that would actually be more of a political leader right. that would put Rome into their place right, right. and then make the Jewish nation you know, rise to the top. Right. But Jesus comes and says, that that's not why I'm here. I'm actually here to give my life as a ransom for many. And in doing that, he's really reminding them right. that he's come for a different reason. So, and part of that is as he describes his kingdom, he says, you know, I didn't come to... Um, I didn't come to rule, but I came to serve. Right, right. And so there's this whole different thing that's happening. Yeah, it's, it's pretty that. cool as we've talked about and as we've seen, like even Josh has talked about it right. over time a couple different times, is that here's like these details of specific names and people because yeah. the readers at this time, it's like, hey, you don't yeah. have to take my word for it, but here's a witness to this event that you can talk to them. And again, exactly. Luke, as the investigative journalist, he's being thorough and giving those details and, is, and those yeah. thoughts. But I think you're absolutely right. Like as in my mind, what I want to do is once I've read the story of Jesus and I know the story of Jesus, then I start to go, Oh, well, but what about Simeon? Like, does he have a backstory? But really it's all comes back to this story is about Christ. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. about what he's done. It's yeah. about what he's doing, what his, you know, arrival on earth, his incarnation actually means becoming right. moving from God in heaven to here with us. And that's what yeah. I think Luke does a really good job. So I think sometimes when I think those questions, I've almost got to reel myself back in of going, okay, well, what's Simeon's story? Like, does yeah. he have a cool backstory yeah. that I can, it's like, but, but wait, really the story is about Jesus and I've got to remember yeah, yeah, that. So yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so as we talked about kind of that first step, I guess, um, do you know any more? Is there any more? And this is just kind of off the cuff. Is there any more? So this purity ritual or, or this, what would in, entail? So it would entail a sacrifice, mm -hmm. but then also we see that Jesus was circumcised. Was there right. Was there more to it than this? Or, or, I mean, is that pretty much what we see in Scripture is what happened? I mean, he's circumcised, there's a sacrifice, and then, yeah. I don't know, there's a party back at the... Right, right. You know, Joseph's house. I don't know. What, yeah, like, yeah. at least that's what we do today. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's true. I, I, mean, I think that's pretty much what happened. Okay. But, but the significant thing that happens also because of Simeon and Anna is that they affirm that this yeah. is actually the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is yeah. Jesus. So they actually affirm that what the angels told Mary and Joseph has actually come true. Yeah. So when they say his name is Jesus, they're, they're actually entering into the temple and they're following all the temple rituals in the right way they should, yeah. which also points to the fact that Mary and Joseph are actually concerned about Jesus's um, spiritual development. Mm. Like they're actually placing him in the context of the temple mm. so that people can then understand he can see his life yeah. through that whole lens. So he is following every ritual and custom that the, the Jews would have said were important. Yeah, yeah. And, and that helps Jesus as he's actually forming his sense of identity, yeah. his sense of who he is, who God's called him to be. And so this story becomes really significant because yeah. then you get to the next part where Jesus wanders off yeah. at the <laughs> Passover and the parents think he's, you know, he's at home or they think he's with the other relatives. And then they all start looking for him. And, yeah. and then he says to them, Hey, you know, um, you know, they say to him, well, you weren't doing, you know, what your father and mother wanted. And he says, well, wait, I was actually doing what my father, right. he's referring to God as his father right. wanted. And so there's this interesting yeah. interplay between them. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Um, as, as I'm looking at this uh, in verse 33, it says, uh, Mary and Joseph were amazed. And as we've just looked at this, yeah. this wonder series and, um, and maybe Josh had this in mind as he thought about it, but I, I've really enjoyed just kind of seeing in scripture, the amazement and the wonder and yeah. the, you know, where it says that Mary pondered all of these things and like she considered these things. And I just, in, in this, you know, second half of, of chapter two, it seems really evident probably because it's a couple different times instead of Mary getting mad at 12 year old Jesus, like right. she's considering these things she and, is. and here's Joseph and Mary at the temple at eight days old. And they're amazed at this prophecy. Like, I wonder how that looked like, I can't help but inject my thoughts into the story, but right, right, like right, here right. they are eight day old Jesus, like born in a stable life's a little bit crazy right now, but they show up at the temple the way that they're supposed to. So I'm assuming that they stayed for a good yes, amount of time. That's right. And then like, they probably weren't coming in with any expectations other than to fulfill the law that they were required to. Yet, here's this prophetic moment with both Simeon and Anna, and they're amazed. I just, yeah, that's right. I think that it's pretty awesome as you look at this story. And so, I guess uh, I feel like Wonder was a great title for, I think for so this too. series. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, it's interesting because um, part of what happens is Mary, Mary doesn't fall victim. I, I liked this idea of, um, you know, that we sometimes, I said in the sermon, we sometimes try to fit God into certain boxes, mm, you yeah. know, but Mary doesn't fall victim to that. She's actually willing to let God expand her horizons yeah. and sort of blow her mind. Like, um, and so she's constantly thinking about what Jesus did yeah. and she's examining that and, and she's seeing that in light of the angel's visit to her right. and to Joseph. I mean, like this is all adding up to her, which right, is right. meaning that she's now realizing Jesus is actually beginning to fulfill the reason he's here, which is actually yeah. pretty interesting because he's he's a pre-adolescent. He's 12 years old. I mean, he isn't even at the whole um, point of passage where he would be when he thir when he's 13, he becomes sort of a full blown adult. Yeah, and you then you had later, mentioned that in yeah. so so at 13 both male and female or right. is it specific to male because that that well, custom in that time at that was... point it was more males but okay. but later the bat mitzvah became so there's the bar mitzvah bat yep. mitzvah it's for women and men or for boys and girls as they're becoming adults in the community okay now you didn't even at 13 so that and this actually happened about 400 years after Christ's birth is where the Jewish community actually started to talk about bar mitzvah more okay. seriously. So there's okay. a lag time there. But the reality is that um, at 13, and a, a child was often seen then as an emerging adult. Okay. They became a full member of the people of Israel at the age of 30. Okay. And okay. so especially the so it's kind of like adult at 13 ish, yeah. but you know right. mature but at 30 full, yeah like, full which is interesting because jesus that goes along with jesus's timeline yeah, right right so he starts his ministry about 30 years old yeah that's his full-blown ministry but he's mm. already living into the reality that he's different than everybody else even as a pre-adolescent yeah that's that's pretty interesting so that was one of my thoughts too of just of going okay so 13 and 30 like the significance of it and it seems to make sense because yeah. i mean what we know is that mary is you know, for women about childbearing age is when they would right. be married off. So it makes sense that they kind of viewed them around that time as an adult. And even from some of my, my study, I think that it was like the book of learning at, at 12 was kind of where you either went into a profession right. or you continued to be taught in the ways to become a Pharisee or a teacher yeah, of the law. Right. Yeah. So it seems to make sense that 13, which, I mean, this could be a plug. I worked for years in youth <laughs> ministry. This could be a plug to say, yeah. Hey, lean yeah. into your teenagers yeah. and make them respond for things and start giving them ownership and responsibility uh, that even yeah. that term teenager is something that I think it was is a book that I read I think it was called do hard things it showed up in the the 50s teenager but yeah really teenagers are are people that should get responsibility and yeah and, that's right anyway that's, well, that's a I side would, tangent I would but. add to that too that I think one of the things that's happening here is that there there's a rite of passage happening. Mm. So one thing that parents can actually think about is what yeah. are the rites of passage for your teenagers? And so mm. one of the things that happens here is that Jesus, and, and it's significant because part of what happens is his whole family takes off to go yeah. to the Passover festival. Yeah. Well, not everybody was required to go. Right. And right. so one of the 
one of the things that's happening actually is that this is a sign of Mary and Joseph's devotion. Mary was not required to go at all. Yeah, and let me interject because you had said a comment that you said that the temple was the focal point for Israel. Right. Can you explain? And I think that you're doing that now, so I'm just right. kind of right. interjecting that thought. But what do you what do you mean by that? Like, yeah. I mean, I feel like I I have a pretty good understanding of that because I've done a lot of studying right, myself. Right. But but for somebody that maybe hasn't, or they're going. Okay, they seem to go to the temple a lot, but why was right. it the focal point? Right. Well, because what was happening at the temple was people were then rehearsing all the story of how God had acted through all of the centuries. Yeah. So one of the things that's happening actually is they go to the temple and they're there for, you know, the whole Passover idea is they're actually rehearsing again God's deliverance of the people of Israel from Exodus yeah. and the Exodus and from Pharaoh in particular. And so that's really significant, but it's also significant for Jesus yeah. because part of what's going to happen is he's going to now begin to see himself in that story. Mm. And the larger part of this that Luke hasn't revealed yet is that Jesus actually is going to be the Passover lamb yeah, right. who comes and forgives everybody for their sins um, by believing in him. Yeah. And so that's really significant too. So, so Mary and Joseph have their own sense of devotion. They're committed to this. The temple is the place where, as we've seen, they bring babies, they dedicate babies. It's, right. it's a place where they form their sense of identity. It's their place where they see themselves in the larger story of God, which I think is really important. And, and it becomes a place where they begin then to live into that story in a way where where God's actually working and changing them. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. So, um, moving on to that uh, verse 39, which I think in the message is, is one of those verses that you kind of quickly just glanced over or, or read quickly. I, I can't remember which one, but verse 39 and verse 52 look like they parallel each other, yes, but it, that's it says that Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and favor with God. Yeah. And as we've already talked about what we're going to get to in Luke 2:52, is he grew with favor with right. God, and man with wisdom, stature and favor with people. So we're going to park on that, but I just thought it was interesting. There's, there's this parallel. So after eight days, they leave the temple. It says he grows. He's, yeah. He gets favor. There's wisdom. Like there's this kind of same thing that happens. Then we see him again at 12 and there's this continuation of what we've already seen. Yeah. Um, so kind of moving to that second part of the, the story where Jesus is left at the temple during Passover. So mm -hmm. For three days, he's lost. Right. Like, first of all, if there's any parents, like, I know that there's, I've heard stories, like, I'm not a parent yet myself, but I know that there's stories where sometimes people yeah. have said, the, like, the worst feeling they've ever had is to leave their kids. Yeah. Well, if you didn't leave your kids somewhere for three days, like, <laughs> this is home alone in real life, minus all the craziness right, of right. the, you know, Kevin McAllister's pranks and whatnot. But this is three days. He is gone. Like... I just I want to inject myself into that story and go, what would that have been like? Yeah. Like, <laughs> how do you do that? Yeah, I, yeah. I, well, I think it's so they they traveled as a family. Yeah. So there's a sense of um, you can understand to some degree that if they're thinking Jesus is with the first group, like right, they're, right. you know, they're in a caravan, but you can figure there's some people way ahead yeah. and others way behind, um, you know, Mary and Joseph, who knows at what rate they were traveling but yeah, right. but the family went like the whole family was there so they they say they think maybe it's with the relatives which yeah, you know you right. get that right but, okay but it's still sort of like uh, i don't know what's going on here yeah you know? i still feel like wouldn't you check yeah, i don't know yeah. uh, maybe well, that's judgmental but and, no it's interesting because like one of the things i was thinking about was that um, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about this Jesus, like what, what's going on with him? I mean, yeah. so he not only lets his parents go on without him, right. but he also has, he has sort of the guts to yeah. enter into right. the temple, which is one of right. the most daunting buildings in the whole area. And, and he goes in and he not only listens to what going what's going on but he actually starts to debate yeah. with the um, theologians and the uh, scholars that are there and and they're pretty much amazed at what he says so you know it's like he's already living into the reality of who he is and i'm um, starting to understand that in different ways so that's pretty amazing in itself yeah i was just looking up that scripture it's 47 or 46 it says after three days they found him in the temple courts sitting among the teachers listening to them and asking questions like yeah. it's just yeah amazing that he's in engaging on a level of right i mean these men again if 30 was right. a, 
you know, full maturity, like 13, you're an adult, but full maturity, like he's engaging with these men yeah. about biblical questions and discussion. So he's engaging his mind, like not something that he was, that was foreign to him that he was like trying to figure right. out as That's he went, right. but he's engaging in these questions. I think is pretty, pretty cool to it see. It is cool. I did have a question. Is there like the significance three days lost? Like I can't help but wonder as you look at that, you know, there's another time in scripture. I That's think it's true. pretty popular uh, or pretty well known that three days was pretty significant yeah. for Christ's yeah. burial. But yeah. is there any, I don't know if this is a little bit of a reach or maybe it's just a coincidence, but is there any connection between the three days gone to the three days that in the tomb? Yeah, he was in the tomb. I, you know, that's a great question. I don't really know. I mean, yeah. I hadn't looked into that, but that's interesting. I, I do think that, um, you know, a lot of times that number three is significant. Right, right. I mean, and so uh, again, um, like in the Hebrew scriptures, seven is always the perfection, but three also has with it its own, you know, sense of this is important. Listen to this. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just, <laughs> just something it's to think good, about. You know, it's a good question. I mean, you know, another thing that came up, not to sidetrack you, but, um, you know, I had a little discussion with one of our members about, well, did Jesus actually sin? Right? Yeah, actually, I wanted to get into that too. Yeah. So please continue. Yeah. So, I mean, it was sort of an interesting question. I mean, like, cause I, I, said, you know, do you think Jesus ever got put on restriction? Do you think Jesus ever had a timeout, had his <laughs> allowance cut, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but it's interesting. So that does put us sort of at a, an awkward place because yeah. the, the insinuation of that is, did Jesus actually break yeah. the law? Did he actually sin? And of course we believe that he didn't sin, that right. he was right. the pure sacrifice of God. And so, um, but, but it's interesting just to sort of play with that and sort yeah. of think about that a little bit. And so, um, but the thing that I think Luke actually does is he, he ties that together in a way where he shows that even though Jesus was um, not there when his parents were looking for him, he still shows them that he was actually about his father's business. Yeah, but in yeah. that sense, he uses this term for heavenly father as opposed to earthly mm -hmm. father. And there's mm -hmm. a differentiation there. And so in doing that, he also, um, the Bible then says, and so Jesus obeyed his parents. He was right. obedient to his parents. And so, you know, you could say, well, was he breaking the Ten Commandments? Like, you know, honor your father and mother. Well, the answer is no, he wasn't. Yeah. He, he was actually, you know, he, at that point, he obeyed them and went back with them and did everything they wanted and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so, and so my question is a variant yeah. to that initial question. I don't believe that Jesus sinned. Right. But I do believe that it's possible that his parents sinned because Jesus was infallible. They were fallible. Right, right. So right, right, in right, my right, mind, right. could it have been that Jesus was ever punished, not because he did anything wrong right. or because there was sin, but because his parents were fallible and and I don't know that yeah, yeah. like this instance of where the parents lost Jesus, like let, right, let's right, just right, call right, a spade right. a spade. They lost Jesus. Right. right? right, right. Like <laughs> I could imagine that Mary or Joseph is a little bit upset. Like, Hey, you got to make sure you're with us. And even oh, though Jesus yeah. didn't sin, they could be like, Hey, because of that, yeah. Jesus, you can't play your, your Naz Nazareth 64 or whatever. Like you're, I don't know. You can't hang out with your friends. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah, making I stuff up. I mean, but I like, think it could be, you know, I mean, but, but anyway, either whatever happened, he, he submitted to them. He, yeah. You know, he's right. obedient to them. And so, um, and it does, uh, what is it? 51, I think uh, it's towards the end of, exactly. of two. Yeah, it it's does right make a mention to, that he yeah. was obedient to them. Exactly. So, yeah, and, so. I, and I think that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, you know, I don't, I, there's, there's other, and you and I talked about this a little yeah. bit before, but there are other gospels, but they're not authentic. And I think that's not really real important. gospels. Right. Yeah. They're not what you would call canonical, which means that they're not in our canon and the canon, if you which, really look at it, yeah, just kind of the collection, right? Yeah. Like so, the, so, but the thing about it is there was very rigid, um, there were rigid qualifications for what was seen as actual scripture and what was not. Right. So there does exist um, a Gnostic library that has some different views of what Jesus was like as a child, right. but those are not seen as authentic, as authentic scripture. And actually, if you ever read them, like the gospel of Thomas, you can see why in a couple of seconds, why they're not seen because they're just really off the wall and really different. And plus the Gnostics really had this sense of separation. They felt like, like spirit was good, 
but body was evil. And that's right. not at all a Hebrew concept. The Hebrew concept actually says that shalom and all that that comes to people actually comes as a way of healing body, right. healing soul, healing relationships. It's very all-encompassing. Yeah. So, um, so again, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I've heard about this other gospel. And you're like, okay, but wait a second. Where does that come from? Yeah. And, um, and so I think that's also a caution for us. Those are not authentic they've never been seen as actually a real part of scripture. And that's important and to even realize. In, I feel like in my opinion, even calling it a gospel is like, eh, yeah, I agree. I don't I agree. think that you should be doing that. Yeah. Like, and really we, we had talked about the popularity of this really, uh, you know, started to grow this Gnostic gospel, yeah, right. um, started to grow with the Da Vinci code and kind of exactly. everything that came yeah. out with that. And just these pretty crazy theories and ideas. Yeah. So yeah. Um, definitely not something that is inspired scripture. It's not. No. In, and it's and, really, and, it's based on the conspiracy, you yeah, know, right. sort of idea. And I think, again, that's where you get into trouble is like right. when people are saying, hey, there's really another story that's going on. That's not the, right. this isn't the real story. There's really a, a real story below that. Right, ah, right. That just gets really bad, I think, yeah. quick. And so. even just, uh, uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping that I'll do this well. So I'll explain the canon and how scripture became to be scripture, but you're the professor. So you correct me if I'm wrong. So, <laughs> so basically there's this, there's a bunch of writings in, you know, the time of Jesus. And after there's these writings at about as 300 after Christ's death, 300 years after Christ's death or 300 AD, there's this uh, council of people that correct. are meeting together to where they decide what kind of makes it into scripture. Now we believe as believers, obviously that this was Holy Spirit inspired that it, right. it was God was there ordaining this and kind of creating this. And from there, we kind of get the collection of writings and teachings, which are known as the canon. That's it's the, the canon of of the Bible. And and so that's where we get it. So 300 years after, it's kind of the collection. That's the canonization. Is yeah. it? Is it yeah. Can I say it? Canonization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's sure. a... Yeah. Act of it. So that's when we talk about the canon of it. That's how it, right, it came right. to be. Yeah. Um, and then there was other councils that meant. So if you notice that the Catholic Bible is different from the Bible that that's we correct. we teach from, they have more books. Uh, I think it's the Apocrypha. Yeah, the Apocrypha. Yeah. Yep. I think it's like 11 or 13 uh -huh. or yep. something like that. It's, it's, Which actually have been proven to be more historically accurate. Like, so when you get into um, things like not the, more than the Bible, but they've been proven no, to no, be no, historically. But, but they would be, they have a historical value, right. but not an right. inspired value. Correct. That's right. the big thing. So, and um, so again, um, there are times when people will read that, it actually fills in some things. Things like Maccabees right, talks right. about certain things that happened during that time, right, right. but it's still not in our estimation, you know, seen as actual inspired scripture. Right, right. Yeah. So it's it's just kind of, and so this Gnostic gospel was presumably one of these councils that had come, but just yeah. didn't fit into the inspired scripture. So it's not part of our Bible right. today. And and you know, part of what happened was that there were there were certain criteria that definitely yes, were right. apart. So what happened was, um, for example, even with the New Testament, it was whether these letters had been circulated in the churches, right. whether they had been affirmed by the churches they were circulated in, all kinds of different things like that. So this was not a haphazard thing. No, and it right. wasn't like, oh, you're in or out. It was it right. was very well thought through. Or it you was, give enough money, we'll get your book in. Right, like, exactly, yeah. yeah. So it was really, really thought through. And when you really look at what the criteria was for things getting into the canon. Yeah. It was really um, important yeah. and really stringent in that sense. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, hopefully that gives a little bit of understanding. If that does create any questions, yeah. we'd love to hear from yeah, you. So we'll over time at clcfamily.church, <laughs> um, that's not a setup yeah. to try and get you to send more questions. Right. But uh, I think for many of us, for years, I had no idea, like, well, the Bible's just the Bible. It's always been. Like, right. Jesus wrote it this way, right? Like, but there is a, this is how it kind of came to be. And it was a yeah. Council of Trent, um, Council of Carthage, one of those? Um, or am I getting Nicaea. it wrong? Nicaea. See, yeah. look at that. So. I, that's why he's the professor, and I'm <laughs> not. <laughs> So I forget Ooh, the sorry. names of them, but those were also two important yeah, ones, so but I don't remember important. what they were. And um, um, yeah. So anyway, so that yeah. might be a little bit of a, a, a divergent, but it's it's also good to kind of talk about and to be able to know. So yeah, I think the, the important part of that is knowing that there are really good, re like, so when people ask me, well, can I trust the Bible? I say, yes, yeah. because the, the scholarship and the ev evaluation, everything that's gone into that 
really right. does say that the scriptures that we hold in our hands when we've got the old and the new testament are reliable that's right. really important right. so um so yes you can wholeheartedly yeah. um, trust that that is god's word to you and right. and um and allow that to influence you and lead you yeah like w what i've heard a lot of the times is that there's many different authors of the bible right but yes. there's or there's many different writers of the bible but right. one author that's right and that's that kind of goes into even the collection of the canon like yep. well if we believe that god was in that authorship but had different writers well then he saw it from beginning to end to get that's to what correct. we have today that's correct so so there's a you know this period of like you know 1500 years or right. so but but the reality is it's the bible's telling one story right. over and over and yeah. it's a story about how god loves people that's right wants to connect with them wants to become their god and wants them to become god's people right yeah i feel like it's even what we talked about like my desire for simeon to go oh, hey what's the side story in this yeah when really it's it's not about the side story it's about jesus that's right that's like right. so I, yeah. I feel like that we've almost come full circle yeah in that's that. good but, that's good uh but yeah so kind of going back to this, I think it's really fun to kind of think about Jesus as he's growing. And, and my question about, you know, Jesus was infallible, but his parents could have been fallible. Right. So did he ever get punished? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I'll one day ask Jesus in heaven or yeah. I don't know. They may have said next time, don't take off. Like, yeah, you like here. what did that look like? But even <laughs> even in that Mary's response, like, I mean, three days. So maybe maybe she got to work through her emotions. Maybe day one, she was upset. Day two, she's like, okay, I, I miss him. And day three, she's more concerned. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, again, interjecting my thoughts and my emotions into the story. But it's, it's pretty amazing to see that even as she sees where her son is, like yeah. sees what he's doing, and he says, didn't you know that I'd be about my father's business? Or I think uh, the translation that you read said that he would um, – be in his father's house. Right. Like it, it, that she was amazed or she wondered, I forget exactly uh, what that verse said, but the, like it wasn't anger, at least when we see that there, but right, it was right. just a, she says that they were very anxious. Like they were, they were worried about him, which you could totally understand. Like, I mean, yeah. any parent that all of a sudden Anxiously realizes searching. after three yeah. days, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't, didn't know where you were. But the interesting thing about Mary is that yeah. Mary actually does sort of treasure. In fact, yeah, she Mary, Mary these becomes, things. she becomes the person that really sort of, um, when you get into contemplative Christianity or okay. sort of a reflective kind of Christianity, Mary often stands out as the person who's the most reflective. Okay. She is the one who ponders things and brings them in and then sort of thinks and prays over them. Um, but it's also interesting because she's the only adult that goes from these birth stories all the way through Jesus's life. Mm. And so she is a constant sort of companion and she ends up at the cross at the very right, end right. while he's dying for the sins of the world. So, so she is able to adjust her views and let things happen and right, right. not to get too far off, but there's a funny story and I don't know where it's at in the gospels, but there's a funny story where Jesus's family shows up one day because they're sort of worried about him and they're actually sort of calling him out and saying, yeah. Hey Jesus, what's going on? You know, and, and somebody, they send somebody in to tell Jesus that his family's outside waiting right, for him. Right. And Jesus turns, the crowd and he says you know my true family are those who do god's will and he sort of puts a, a yeah. you know like this big you know sort of wall like, right ooh, there and, he just burned his mother <laughs> yeah i mean it was so interesting but but somehow they thought he was sort of getting out of where he was supposed to be but even at that point and he's now an adult yeah at that point he says no i'm actually doing what god's called me to right, do right so his family has to adjust as they go along mm -hmm. and and actually let him be who he's come to be yeah that's right. really important in the yeah. story so that's good. As we're working through that, it's just really good. I, I do want to ask, so I've heard a lot of different teachings over the years, and this is kind of, uh, I'm just asking you to speculate, I guess, or whatever level that you're comfortable with. But like, so Jesus saying that he would be about his father's business or being in his father's house. Do you take that to mean anything specific? Or is it just a general term for, I'm going to be about what the father has purposed me with? He's going to be about his really main reason for coming like is it is it specific or is it more general or is it both uh, i don't know yeah i think it's i think it's more specific i okay. think that he's really saying you know i know one of the things that's interesting is that as a 12 year old 
He's really saying, yeah. I understand why I'm here. Right, right. So when he uses like, so Joseph and Mary use a, f- a family term, like, and basically they're saying, hey, you know, you should have done what your father, you know, your father and mother. And it's sort of like Joseph is your father, your earthly father. But Jesus turns that around and says, yeah. you should have known I would have been about my heavenly father's business. That's really sort of what he's saying. So so what he's doing. So it was is, the polite way of saying you're not my real mom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's, so uh, that's not how Jesus said it. That's just how I'm reading into it. <laughs> You're not my real parents. Yeah. That's not. Jesus yeah. didn't do that because so, that would be disrespectful <laughs> and sin. So he didn't do that. Just just to make that clear. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> but I think what he's doing is he is he is now fully um, embracing why yeah. he's come. Like yeah. I mean, and that's really significant at 12 years old because again, you know, it's it's part of this whole um, this whole developmental task. Like, does Jesus really understand? Yeah. as this pre-adolescent, who he is and why he's here. And he's basically saying, yes, I yeah. understand that. So yeah. that's really good. Yeah, that is good. There was a, a couple sentences uh, or a couple things that I wrote down that I thought you, that you just said, I, I think merited repeating. Um, you said the message of Christ is, or the message of Christmas is that rescue is on the way. And then I thought that this was a really good statement, almost in closing of the series. You said, Wonder means living into the mystery of following God yeah, and inviting him to be first in our lives. And I thought that that was a really good tie in as we're looking at Mary and we're looking at, uh, you know, all of these stories. We're looking at all of these people that were impacted, but each of them had a choice. Even Zachariah, like just everything in it, it's living into the mystery of what God has done and following God. So I just thought that that was a really good tie in. Um, uh, so I guess the, the last things that I, I wanted to talk about, and this is where I planned on parking. I feel like right, right. the conversation's gone pretty well so far, but wanted to park on what you said, kind of your challenge for 2020 was, right. um, and that's Luke two fifty two. It says that Jesus grew in, uh, wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with people. Right. And so you had said that your challenge for 2020 was to prioritize our spiritual growth. And right. so I was wondering if you could spend a few moments maybe talking about each of those things. Sure. How, how do I, as a listener, how do I, as somebody that's sitting, you know, in the church over the weekend, how do I grow in wisdom? How do I grow in stature? And I know that you did allude to this. Like right. if you haven't listened to the message, then you can do that on our website at our media page. Um, so clcfamily.church slash media. Um, and you can listen or you can watch the, the message, but maybe even beyond just what you said there, maybe is there a few things that you can give so that I or a listener, we can grow in our wisdom, in our stature, in our favor with God, and our favor with people. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's my last question then, too. Okay, so you can take okay. as much time or as little time as you want with it. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that really this question begs is it, it begs um, sort of what priority does God play in our lives? And, yeah. and part of that is how much time do we actually give to God? How yeah. much... How much space? And this is this is a spiritual formation question, um, because spiritual formation is all about um, living in the present moment. It's about realizing that God is actually here right now with us. Yeah. So the thing that deters that is a lot of times we live with lots of regrets about the past and we get we get sort of stuck in our past or sometimes we start to worry about the future and we get sort of stuck there. But actual formation, uh, God meeting us always happens in the present moment. Hmm. So with that said, um, part of the question then is, are there certain things that you're doing and thinking about where you're actually inviting God into the present moment and actually creating some space to meet with God so that you can get to know God better? And so there's lots of applications to that. I mean, you know, when you think about Jesus growing, um, he grew physically. So that was with the stature. Um, There were certain things that he did. And we you know, so I challenge people, is there a certain kind of physical goal right. maybe you need for this next year? And, you know, sometimes it's a matter of it might even be things like um, getting more rest. I, yeah. you know, John Ortberg um, one time said that um, maybe the best thing you could do today is take a nap, yeah. which I thought was so funny. And like, I like that. Like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I think I could use a nap. <laughs> but the reality is like, 
you know, we don't think oftentimes about our, sp or our physical well-being, but maybe it's a matter of, you know, how do we actually start to think about that? Maybe it's a matter of actually being more present, being outside more, whatever yeah, that might right. be that might lift your spirits. Um, when it says that Jesus then also um, grew in wisdom, you know, there's a question for us too. So Jesus was growing in wisdom. He was he was more and more convinced all the time of who God had created him to be. He was living into the reality of that. How are we doing that also? Mm. Like, are we increasing our wisdom? So one of the things I thought about right away was, you know, we got lots of good cow classes that are coming up. Right, and, right. you know, we're looking at financial peace, the testimonies. Um, you know, there's Jeff's ongoing class where he's talking about right. the Gospels, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, is there a place that maybe a class could be some place where you could grow, yeah. you know, this time? Um, it also says that he grew in, you know, in his favor with God. So, you know, spiritual growth. And yeah. I, I actually shared a, um, I'm going to share it again. I actually shared a definition for spiritual formation, which I think is really important. So a lot of times we think about growing spiritually. We're not sure what that means, but yeah, right. here's what actually it's by Bob Mulholland, who has written a book um, that, I've, I've enjoyed a lot, but he says spiritual formation is the activity of the Holy Spirit, which molds our lives into the likeness of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world. Mm. And one of the things I really like about that is that it does beg the question, when people look at your life, what do they see? And one of the things I think is important for us as Christians is that hopefully when people look at our lives, part of what they're seeing is Jesus himself. Like they're starting to realize that we are trying to put to practice in our lives the things that Jesus himself did. Yeah. And so I think that's really important for us. Um, I, I think about my life, like I think about the last 10 years even. So now, you know, I've been a Christian for the last 40 years. So it's not like this is a new thing. Longer than I've been alive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> but one of the things that's interesting is even think about the last 10 years, yeah. I can see how God's been growing me in those mm. last 10 years. So, you know, so God is constantly growing us, helping us to become um, more Christ-like. Yeah. And I think that's really important for us to understand. So, you know, when people look at our lives, do they see Jesus? Do they see, you know, that we're more generous? Do they see that we're more encouraging? Do they see that maybe we're actually more truthful about certain things and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's important for us. So how do I like, so what I'm hearing in, in that definition is that it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So if it's right. not something that I actually do, yeah. how do I, I don't know, how do I open myself up to the Holy Spirit being able to to be at work in me. I mean, not that's that, a great question. Not that he needs my permission. Like right. he can be right. at work right. and right. I can choose right. to ignore that. Right. But how do I, how do I align myself in such a way that I'm open to receive from him? Yeah. So, so that's a great question because see, the reality is that we're being formed all the time yeah. by all kinds of things. Yeah. A lot of times we're being formed by really negative things, mm. you know, like we're being formed by um, hurried schedules and, yeah. um, and feeling like we're always behind on stuff. And so we cut people off or we cut our family off. You know, we, we find ourselves in these sort of, sort of downward yeah. trends sometimes. But again, if you go back to the original question, so the question is, is where are you creating space in your life mm. to be with God, right? Mm. So I think that's where this becomes really pivotal because yeah, yeah. if we're actually creating space where we can be with God, then God enters into that space and actually then leads us in the places that we need to go. So, yeah. so some of the practices that people try and I think that are important are things like, you know, how are you reading scripture? How are, right. you, how are you entering into scripture? Are you only reading it because you're studying it, that's one way of reading it. Are yeah. you reading it devotionally in right, a way right. where it's actually influencing you? Another thing might be, are you actually spending time praying? And these are right, these right. are really basic things. Like yeah. I'm not talking about anything that we don't already do. Right, or, right. You know, but it's like or that you know, we don't know how to do. Yeah, you yeah. know, and, and along with praying, are you spending some time actually listening for God? So yeah. one of the things I've loved to do over the years is I'll take a journal, I'll just put a big L on the page. 
and then I'll just be quiet for a while. Okay. And and when I feel like God's actually... L for actually, listen, not for loser. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's like, why is he putting an oh, L yeah. on the page? Yeah, okay. Yeah, for listen. That's right. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, and uh, But what I'll do is that I'll actually sit quietly and just see for what it is that God sort of yeah. brings to mind. And then yeah. I'll write those things down. And that's been some of the most meaningful times I've had in prayer was where I was actually, you know, we think about prayer as talking to God, right. but it's also listening to God. Yeah. So, that's good. so anyway, I think there's lots of stuff. I mean, you know, another idea that I think is really important is um, maybe here at CLC, uh, we, I sort of talked about, you know, is it time for you to step up and actually become a member of the church, which mm. I think what happens with that is instead of just coming to a place, we actually say, no, I want to be a real part of this place. Right, right. Um, and another part of that is that sometimes a step into that is actually beginning to, to serve someplace. Yeah. So, you know, gosh, when we start to serve, we start to grow. Like, because what happens when I walk in and I'm supposed to be helping with kid zone or whatever, you know, right away, I sort of feel my own sort of lack of preparation, or I feel a little bit uneasy, but God steps in yeah. and actually begins to do stuff through us. And then at the end of the day, we're like, wow, God really showed up. Right, right. So I think all that stuff is so yeah. important for us. So that's good. I think that there's such a huge truth in that, that it's many of the times it's simple practices that that you either forget or it's, you know, time just kind of squeezes them yeah. out, but it's things, uh, cause I feel like I'm always looking for, well, what's the new thing? How do I, how do I grow? And how do I, but it's really, it's not anything that's new or life changing. Like we're all wanting that new, better, bigger, faster, like right, mo right. new, improved yeah. item, but it's really more just being intentional. Yeah. Um, and slowing down and being able to spend some time and being intentional in your growth and that's in your right. time. That's right. So I think that that's really good. I think it's a good reminder. Yeah. It's one of those things that it's, I would say that this is one of those conversations that's like, well, you're preaching to the choir. Well, I think right. the reality is that the choir forgets. Right. And that I think it's important for us to, to be reminded of the simple truths of, of the gospel. Like I, I, I'm not, I think that the gospel is simple, not simplistic. Right. It's simple but it's difficult to put into practice. Yeah, that's so right. that's that's, right. that's kind of the tension and the reality that I think we live into as believers. So That's right. Anyway, I think it's that's really good. So um uh, looking at the time, we've got a, a few moments left okay. uh, before we need to to wrap it up, but uh, I guess the last question is is kind of the same thing that we do, we ask every week is that was there anything left on the cutting room floor that you didn't get a chance to talk about? And it's always interesting because I ask that question after we've talked about it for close right. to an hour, right? Like, so if it didn't make it to the cutting room floor the first time, yeah. it probably yeah. made it here. But it, I guess if there's any other thoughts or any other things that you wanted to bring up before we, I guess, kind of say goodbye or yeah. sign out? I, I guess the only thing I would say is that I, I think our spiritual life is given to us intentionally by God. Like mm -hmm. I... I oftentimes think about one of the things that Jesus is actually doing um, in the temple, but as, and continues to do in our lives, he's actually bringing us back to a point where we understand fully that we're created in the image of God. And that because of that, we are called, as Mulholland would say, you know, we're called um, to be like Christ, but for the sake of the world. Mm. And so, you know, a couple of things I thought about too, as I, in my own life, I thought about, so when I start to think about the story of how God actually reached me, yeah, you know, and that was part of the sermon was that there, God actually strategically put this other high school student, I was 17 years old, put Grant, who was a high school student that I had gotten in a lot of trouble with as a freshman in high school, put him into a class with me and Grant's life had changed. He mm. had become a Christian and I had no clue what in the world that meant. <laughs> right. And, um, but God strategically placed Grant there. Grant in that nine months of that class totally influenced me and patiently answered every question I had about God. And, and what was happening was God was actually calling me into God's story. Mm. And I remember specifically um, at the end of that time, I just turned to Grant one day in class and I said, hey, Grant, I go, I don't know how you got all this, but I really, really want what you have. Hmm. And I have no clue how to get it. Yeah. And he said, well, it's really pretty easy. All you have to do is just invite Jesus into your life. And I'm like, OK, that sounds great. But how do I do that? Right, right. So he sort of led me in my first prayer. And okay. I mean, you know, all this stuff. And um, 
but it was really it was really amazing because what was happening was you know god had this whole story that now was becoming my story also right, right. and i was entering into that in a way where um, where i could experience god's love and god's grace and so i would just say again that um you know that's why jesus needs to see his story in the larger story of Israel. Hmm. That's going to guide him in terms of who he becomes and what he's going to do. But it's the same thing is true for us. When we begin to now see our story in the larger picture of what God's actually doing in the world, then we understand who we are, we understand what we're called to, Hmm. and we understand how it is that God wants to be involved with us. So so I would just leave it with that, I think. Yeah, that's good. Well, Thank you, Gary, for your hey, time yeah, for, welcome, for the weekend. Uh, thank you if you are tuning in live with us. We really appreciate the uh, the live um, interaction and being with us. If you're yeah. listening to this via podcast, whether it's a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, who knows, <laughs> after this, man, super excited that you're with us as well. Uh, again, if you are watching live and you're interested in kind of re-listening to this or through the podcast, you can find that pretty much any, any place that you get your podcast through Apple, through iPhone. Um, Apple and iPhone is the same thing, but through Apple, through also Android, uh, Spotify, we're on, all you got to do is search clcfamily.church and you should see us pop up right away. Um, if you do have kind of a, a medium that you go to or a, uh, a source that you go to that we're not listed, let us know that as well. We'll, it's pretty much free to post it. So let us know where, wherever we can post that. Um, you can also listen to the messages, uh, find a lot of information on clcfamily.church. Um, yeah, so we just want to say thank you again for, yeah, for being with us. We hope to see you this weekend as we start a brand new series. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun Saturday at 5 and then Sunday at 9 o'clock and at 1045. And then also we hope that you can connect with us in about a week. It's actually six days from now as we relaunch Cow on January 8th. So thanks for joining us. Uh, have a great week and bye. See ya.